Chicago. Pre- I'd like to see William. Yes, uh, I'm at a... Yes. Hello? Okay. Yeah, I, What's I, going on? I, I, just, I, just, I just see the police to come by. Um, I work with an artist. I, I, I don't really want to say his name, but he stayed here. He, was, he went to Subway. He was walking by some guys. Jesse Smollett, born on June 21st, 1982 in Santa Rosa, California. He is an American actor and singer, best known for his roles on Empire, The Mighty Ducks, and Alien Covenant. And some of his most popular songs and features are Ha Ha I Love You, Conqueror, and Need Freedom. Now I know most of you have heard about this case already, but there's quite a bit of info that I want to go over with you all. So, as you all know, on January 29th, 2019, Jesse leaves his Chicago apartment at around 2 a.m. to go to Subway and get a sandwich. After that, as he's making his way back to his home, he's attacked by two masked men. Jesse survives a scuffle, goes back to his apartment, and tells his creative director, Frank Gatson, what just happened. He also said that it was a racist and homophobic attack. So Frank Gadsden then calls 911. Let's take a listen. I worked with an artist. I, I, I don't really want to say his name, but he stayed here. He, was, he went to Subway. He was walking by and some guys, I don't know, they jumped him or something like that. And I just want to report it and make sure he's all right. Okay. So we're just checking the well-being. Okay. So. Yeah. Is this upper or lower? Huh? Okay. I'm, it's, it's, I'm, I'm waiting in the lobby. I'm going to go back up to the apartment. Okay, so you're going back to the apartment. So you're just going to leave yeah. them there? Yeah, I, I came down because I didn't realize the address. I, I didn't realize the address. And, you know, he was cool. He didn't want me to call you guys, but I feel like he needs to make a report. <laughs> Okay, so did okay. You can't make the report for him. Did he want to make a report? No, no he, 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 he I, that's why I'm, I'm doing. You, he's definitely going to make the report. I'm going to make him make the report. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Yes, it is. This is behind the Lowe's Hotel on the side. Okay. All right. And what unit is the is the police coming for? Sure. Okay, so that's the apartment. Yes. And and the front desk guy here is sitting here. And what is your name, sir? My name is. Does your friend need an ambulance? I, I he just he just he, I just think he's startled. Well, it's really weird, ma'am, just because I'm scared. I don't know what it is. They they, they put a noose around his neck. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't do anything with it. Put it around his neck. That's really fucked up to me. Sorry, for saying it like that. Hello. Okay, and what is your phone number, just in case the police need to call two, you? Two. Okay, and this is a, a well-known person? Yes, it is. All right, watch for the police. Sorry? I said watch for the police. All right, so I'm going to go back up to the apartment. Okay. That's right. Yes. That's okay. Yes. I'll tell the All police. Right. Okay? Okay, thank you. Well, All thank right, you so sir. much, okay? All right, good luck, yes, you bye. guys. Bye-bye. Okay. After Frank calls M11, police show up to Jesse's apartment. How's it going? Okay, what's going on? So Jesse told police that he was punched in the face. They wrapped the rope around his neck and they poured bleach on him. He also said that they yelled MAGA, a slogan that was often used by Trump and his supporters. As I was crossing the intersection, I heard Empire. And I don't answer to Empire. <laughs> <laughs> My name ain't Empire. Uh, and I didn't answer. I kept walking and then I heard Empire. N-. So I turned around and I said, the f- did you just say to me? I and mean, I see the uh, attacker uh, masked. And he said, this MAGA country n- punches me right in the face. By the way, I want to point something out. He's wearing all these pins for, um, you know, for all these great causes, which is great for sure. But he's lying his ass off, which is <laughs> crazy. Anyway, a week before the attack, they sent him this letter. In fact, the week before the attack, police confirm a letter was sent to the Fox studio in Chicago with threatening language and laced with powdery substance, likely Tylenol. Do you think there's a link between the letter and the attack? Um... 
And you did mention it to the police right away Absolutely. about the letter. Absolutely. Um, just because on the letter it had a stick figure hanging from a tree with a gun pointing towards it, with the words that said, small at Jussie, you will die, black There was no address, but the return address said in big red, you know, like caps, MAGA. Did I make that up too? So Jesse Smollett then gets a massive amount of support for coming forward and being brave. Well wishes for Smollett continue to pour in on social media from celebrities like John Legend and Ariana Grande to former Vice President Joe Biden. His Empire co-star Taraji P. Henson also sending her support, tweeting, I wish what happened to my baby was just one bad joke, but it wasn't. And we all feel his pain right now. Jesse Smollett is pure love to the bone. Okay, so he gets all this support and all of this praise. And uh, he even goes on to saying that, uh, <laughs> I, can't, I can't even say with the straight face, but he says that he's the gay Tupac. Let's, uh, let's take a look. I was bruised, but my ribs were not cracked. They were not broken. I went to the doctor immediately. Frank Gatson drove me. I was not hospitalized. Both my doctors in LA and Chicago cleared me to perform, but said to take care, obviously. And above all, I fought the fuck back. <laughs> Yeah, I can't believe he said that either. Anyway, this is how investigators get to the truth. Timeline, please. On January 30th, 2019, police released a photo of two men who were close by at the time of the attack. January 31st, 2019, Jesse refuses to hand over his phone. Police wanted to confirm details and quote, including the MAGA references made, as the actor says he was on the phone to his manager at the time. February 1st, the actor says he's okay after the incident. In a statement, he wrote this, the outpouring of love and support from my village has meant more than I will ever be able to truly put into words. I am working with authorities and have been a 100% factual and consistent on every level. February 11th, Jesse Smollett gives police a PDF file of his phone records after they had originally asked for his phone and he'd refused. But the files were redacted. Some bits were covered up. The police said there's no reason to suspect any wrongdoing from Jesse and are not looking at charges regarding filing a false report. February 14th, persons of interest arrested by police. The two people of interest were arrested and interviewed by police, but not charged and not treated as suspects. They are Ola and Abel, brothers originally from Nigeria. They had worked as Empire Extras, sometimes going to the gym with Jesse. Some of the items seized from a police raid of their home include a black face mask, an Empire script, phone, receipt, a red hat, and bleach. February 17th, the investigation took a turn. Police said there's been some developments in this investigation. A day after they released the Nigerian brothers without charge, police then said, we want to speak to the individual who reported the incident. Jesse Smollett. February 20th, Jesse is charged by police with disorderly conduct and filing a false police report. The Nigerian brother said Jesse paid them $3,500 to stage an attack. He wanted to take advantage of the pain and anger of racism to promote his career. A reporter even obtained footage showing the brothers buying materials, including the ski mask they used in the alleged attack. Here in the uptown neighborhood at a beauty supply shop, what you're seeing them purchase are a couple of balaclavas or ski masks along with some gloves that they bought at this nondescript shop in Uptown and a red cap. Specifically, we're told by staff here, they sought out those items. They don't sell a whole lot of ski masks here, they tell me, but these two brothers seem very eager to pick them up and seemed very urgent about that. According to a store security guard, who tells me the brothers stood out in his mind. He had questions about their purchases, about what they were doing there. And well, he believes he knows the answers now. February 21st, Jesse was arrested, but then released on bond. He then went on to work on the Empire set to shoot some scenes. You know, he was probably thinking, I got this. They ain't got nothing on me. I'm just gonna keep claiming my innocence. 
February 22, Jesse is suspended from Empire. The TV show's executive producers release a statement saying the actor won't be in the final two episodes of the later series, adding that the allegations against him are, and quote, disturbing. March 1st, the Nigerian brothers regret getting involved. Their lawyer released a statement saying the brothers have tremendous regret over their involvement in the situation. They understand how it has impacted people across the nation, minority communities, and especially those who have been victims of hate crimes themselves. March 14th, Jesse Smollett appears in court charged with 16 counts of disorderly conduct and pleads not guilty. March 26, all charges against Jesse are dropped. His lawyer said he was a victim and made to appear as a perpetrator. April 12th, Jesse is sued by the city of Chicago. Police wants to be compensated for the manpower used investigating his alleged assault and added that they still believe he staged the attack. April 23rd, the Nigerian brother sued Jesse's legal team for defamation. February 12th of 2020, six new charges. Special prosecutor Dan Webb, who was assigned to investigate how the case was handled, said in a statement he is going to further prosecute Jesse. The actor is charged with six counts of lying to police. November 29th, 2021, a new trial begins. Jesse reportedly denies ever being involved in a hoax and still claims he's innocent. December 9th, guilty. The jury finds him guilty of five of the six counts of disorderly conduct, meaning that the last one had not been proven in court. Each count carries a penalty of up to three years in prison. Video shows the Osindaro brothers walking toward the direction of Smollett's apartment building, and in this video, you can clearly see a flash of a red-rimmed hat. Police notes and hardware store surveillance video shows one of the brothers apparently purchasing that hat, along with other items like that thin white rope to be used during the alleged hoax. Also, the new video shows Smollett walking in the middle of the street in the same white sweater he was later seen wearing when police arrived. And as you could see on this video, it was such a frigid night, there's hardly anyone else in sight other than Smollett and the brothers. Another piece of new video from a garage shows Smollett in the white sweater, looking calm, perhaps a cell phone in hand. And then a very short while later, the Osindaro brothers are seen walking down the same sidewalk. The attorney for the brothers tells Fox News that the brothers were likely arriving early and kind of were circling the area waiting for Smollett to return. March 11th, 2022, sentencing and jail time. So after three years of just going back and forth, Jesse Smollett was sentenced to 150 days jail time in order to pay a fine of $145,000. His sentence also includes 30 months of probation. And Judge James Lynn ripped them a new one and said this. I've been a criminal judge for many years. And I've heard many victims of crimes testify in front of me. And any victim of a crime, no matter what the crime is, they are demoralized by what happens to them. It doesn't matter if you're injured unjustifiably, if somebody hurts you and it maybe uh, cripples you or damages you uh, in, in some fashion that's going to be uh, long-standing injuries. If your property is stolen, your vehicles are stolen, people go into your homes, your prop possessions are, are, are stolen, uh, People do all kinds of terrible things. It is a demoralizing experience. And sometimes it's the worst experience that anybody can, can ever uh, go through in their entire life. And then if it turns out that the motivation for the criminal to do something bad to you was because they hate you, they hate you because of your race, because of your ethnicity, because of your gender, your sexual orientation, your religion, your age, your disability, if that was the reason for it, it is exponentially worse. There is nothing worse than to be a victim of a hate crime. It is the worst thing that can happen, especially in our country with all our history and all that we're going through now to try to get around some of these issues. Hate crimes are the absolute worst. And I believe that you did damage to real hate crimes, to hate crime victims. There are people that are actual, genuine victims of hate crimes that you did damage to. These are people that are, have a difficult time coming forward. They may be mistrustful. They may not want to bring it to the attention of the community or first responders. Uh, there may be some trepidation. I don't know for sure how much damage there was. I don't know how this is going to impact other people, if they're going to be hesitant to come forward because they're going to think that they're going to be accused of acting like you and, and doing a stunt like you pulled here. So I'm trying to consider who you are as a person, how you got here, how somehow you strayed away from your family values. You let that dark, narcissistic, selfish, and arrogant side come out and you persisted with it for years on this case. And Jesse's final words were... Do you have any questions? 
No, I would just like to say to Your Honor that I am, uh, I am not suicidal. That's what I would like to say. Okay. I am not suicidal. Okay. I am not suicidal. I am innocent, and I am not suicidal. If I did this, then it means that I stuck my fist in the fears of black Americans in this country for over 400 years and the fears of the LGBT community. Your Honor, I respect you and I respect the jury, but I did not do this. And I am not suicidal. And if anything happens to me when I go in there, I did not do it to myself. And you must all know that. I respect you, Your Honor. I respect your decision. Jail time. I am not suicidal. So there you have it. Um, you know this this person Jesse. He's a um, he's an evil person for sure, and I can smell a a, a douchebag from a mile away, and he he's one of them. Um, I also can't still believe that he was wearing these pins, and just and just lying to everyone's faces, man. Hey, who who does that? I for sure think that he's a narcissist. I mean, maybe I don't know. His uh, his mannerisms, the way that he speaks, the way that he carries himself, and you know how people say that his career is over. I don't think it is. I really don't. Usually, celebrities get away with this kind of stuff, and then they come back because they have connections and they're famous and they got money and some producer or director or writer is gonna put them eventually on a TV show or a movie. That's just usually how it goes. I'm pretty sure this this dude, this person is gonna eventually come back. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna be right away, but give them a few years and I think you're eventually going to see him in, uh, you know, like I said, in some TV show or movie. But anyway, like I said, what do you guys think about, about this person, about Jesse Smollett and uh, about this case? Anyway, let's move on to the next case. Nine one one. what is the location of your emergency? Uh, good afternoon. I'm calling from the... Uh, what is the address? The address is... Okay. Yeah. Okay, and what's going on there? Bob Saget, born on May 17th, 1956, in Philadelphia. He is an American actor, stand-up comedian, and TV host. Best known for America's Funniest Home Videos, Dumb and Dumber, Entourage and Fuller House. Now on January 9th, 2022, a 911 call is placed from the Ritz Cart in Orlando, Grand Lakes Hotel, which is the hotel where Bob was staying in. Now let's listen to the call and I'll give you all the info after. Okay, and what's going on there? Uh, we have a, we have an unresponsive guest in a room my officer is telling me that he that there's no pulse and the uh, okay. What room number? He's in room. Okay. Non-responsive, not breathing. Yeah. Um. Not responsive, not breathing, and no pulse. Okay. Stand the line for medical. One moment. Thank you. Do you know how old? Okay, for rescue. Yes, 20. Okay. And caller, I have the phone number. Uh, the direct phone number. So just minutes before that Nama Mon call, family members had actually phoned the hotel to do a welfare check on Saget. He was supposed to check out of the hotel that day, but family members were unable to reach him. That's when they called security to check on him. A member of the Reds Carton security team knocked on Saget's door several times, but received no response. When they entered the room, they found Saget cold to the touch, yellow and clammy. Bob Saget was declared dead at 4.18 p.m. He was 65 years old. Yes, very sad news from Orlando, Florida. The Orange County Sheriff's Office confirms that actor and comedian Bob Saget was found dead a few hours ago in an Orlando hotel room. Now, there's a lot of theories of how Bob died 
and if it was a case of murder. But in February, a judge granted the Saget family's request that the full report on his death remain sealed. So the case into how Bob Saget died is now closed. All we know is that the night before Saget was found emotionless in his hotel room, he performed what turned out to be the last show of his I Don't Do Negative tour at the Ponte Vedra concert hall just outside of Jacksonville. After the show ended, he had nearly a two and a half hour drive ahead of him back to the Ritz Carton Hotel in Orlando. The police report shows Saget used his key to enter his room at 2.17 a.m. on Sunday morning, which means he needed to leave the venue at around 11.30 on Saturday night at the latest. And Saget's widow, Kelly Rizzo, told Good Morning America he called her that evening on the way back to the hotel, saying what a wonderful show it had been that he was happy and loving. Now Saget was found with multiple fractures in his skull and a toxicology screen revealed the presence of some prescription drugs, but nothing the medical examiner noted as a contributing factor in his death. No alcohol or illegal substances were found. Some experts are questioning the autopsy findings today. There is no hotel room I've ever stayed in that would allow for a fall significant enough to cause this kind of head injury. Uh, this is the kind of injury that might occur from a traffic accident, uh, might occur from an assault, might occur from a fall down a, a flight of stairs. And there's also some conspiracy theories going around online about how he died. One is that he was assaulted after the show, but he brushed it off and didn't want to press charges. Another is that Saget died as a result of the COVID-19 vaccine. The autopsy report shows Saget tested positive for COVID-19. He even told the stage crew before the show in Pontevedra that he wasn't feeling too well due to COVID complications. He stated himself that he was getting not getting over COVID, it was one of those, he said that he had um, something like he said like long-term COVID, meaning that it was taking him a long time for his body to get over it. Okay. Um, he said that his hearing had been off, and that was the case for that evening. He was asking the sound guys to turn everything up, and that he had been sick the night before. And sick in the sense of like his, you know, his hearing was off. He said that he had a sore throat, that he had, um, that he was happy that he had lozenges for the stage. But he seemed okay. He seemed that he, and here is my interpretation, because I did hear him say, you know, I don't feel good, but I'm ready to do the show. He said, this is what I do this for, you know, it's kind of like he was trying to talk himself up. But some I also want to point out that Saget's room was in order. There were no signs of foul play. Everything was neatly in its place. There was no blood, no weapons, no signs that there was a disturbance. What the medical examiner believes is that Saget's fatal head injury could have been caused by a flaw on the carpeted floor. Other hard surfaces visible in the photos show no sign of an impact or damage. But now I pass the question on to you. What do you think happened here? Was it an accidental death? Or murder. Trauma specialist Dr. Robert Duarte studied the autopsy report. This wasn't just a little bump on the head, right? Exactly. There were fractures in the base of the skull, in the occipital region, the temporal region. There was also fractures in the front, above the eye, on both sides of the, of the skull. So even though we're hearing he hit his head on the back of his head, it caused fractures in three places, even the front. Exactly. The police investigation is now closed, so the mystery may never be solved. Hey, different United Airlines. We have our, uh, one of our international flights coming in from London. It's about 10 minutes out and it's a medical emergency. Carrie Fisher, born October 21st, 1956 in Burbank, California. She is best known for playing Princess Leia in the Star Wars films. She is also known for her writing. In 1987, she wrote the hit book, Postcards from the Edge, which she adapted into a movie starring Meryl Streep. Excuse me? Well, she couldn't stay with her father anyway. He's worse than she is. Not that you're bad. But in between all the fame and success, Carrie suffered battles with mental illness and drug abuse. 
In a statement, she said this. I am mentally ill. I can say that. I am not ashamed of that. I survived that. I'm still surviving it, but bring it on. But unfortunately, on December 23rd, a Namamon call was made by one of the staff members of United Airlines. She said that they had a medical emergency for a passenger. That passenger was Carrie Fisher. Let's take a listen. We have our, uh, one of our international flights coming in from London. It's about 10 minutes out, and it's a medical emergency for a passenger in two Fox what, Trot uh, female. What satellite? Uh, terminal 7, gate 74. Terminal 7, hold on a second. 34, gate 74? Gate 74, yes. Alpha, Bravo, or? No, it's just 74. Okay. Yep. And what's the airline again? Uh, United Airlines. What's the flight number? 935 from London. LHR. 935. And you're, call you're calling uh, from United Airlines, United right? United Operations. Operations. Okay, what's uh, your mm -hmm. callback? And what is the yeah, age of the patient? The uh, age of the patient? Female. And what's wrong with her? No, what's yeah, wrong? Well, what's wrong with her? Oh. Okay, hold on. Okay. Let's see. What? Oh, two. I already told Marley. Yeah, I'll call the supervisor and then I'll call them. Okay, the same and then I'll call them. Thanks, Mark. What's the ETA on that? Um, twelve. They said twelve twenty-eight. Twelve twenty-eight. Okay, and what's the ETA? Twelve twenty-eight. Yeah. No, it's making up time. I would. It's it's in ten minutes. They'll be on the ground in ten minutes. So let's see here. Oh, ten minutes. Carrie Fisher was in a flight from London to Los Angeles when she went into cardiac arrest. She died at UCLA Medical Center just four days later on December 27th. Also, her mother, Debbie Reynolds, died the following day. She was 84 years old. Man, it's sad that Carrie Fisher is no longer with us. Um, I'm a huge fan of Star Wars. Huge fan. I love the movies. I love the merch, everything about it, man. I also found this article by People that said that Debbie possibly died from a broken heart. I don't know if that's actually possible, but I think it could happen. Cause you know, I've heard of like these older couples that are like in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and that when one of them passes away, the other passes soon after which is so sad you know imagine being with someone for so long you know for decades and then all of a sudden that person just you know passes away and i imagine i mean i don't know i imagine you just feel so lost because again you're with that person for decades for so long every single day and then they're just one day they're just not there anymore i don't know it's it's kind of sad man but yeah Let's move on to the next call. I heard about my paramedics. Hi, I think my mom is dead. What's the address? Then? What was the last time you saw her awake? I just I don't know last night. Oh, okay, what's your cross street there, ma'am? Tina Marie. Born March 5th, 1956 in Santa Monica, California. She was an American songwriter, musician, composer, arranger, and producer. Some of her most popular songs are Ooh La La La, Lover Girl, Square Biz, I Need Your Lovin', and I'm a Sucker for Your Love. And on December 26, 2010, Tina Marie's daughter, Aliyah Rose, makes a tragic Nama Wong call, saying that her mother is cold and unresponsive. Let's take a listen. What was the last time you saw her awake? I just, I don't know, last night. Oh, okay, what's your cross street there, ma'am? Lamoma. How old is she? She's 54. 54? Yes. Okay, PD, are you around? Yes. Okay, what's your phone number, ma'am? Okay, do you want to try and do CPR? I don't know. I, don't I can know. guide you, I can guide you, but I'm going to need you to. I'm so scared. I'm so scared. Okay. okay, how's she positioned right now? Is she. Ma'am? Her color. 
is gone. The what? Her color is gone. Does she feel cold to the touch? Yes, it's cold. Okay. All right. We'll be there shortly, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Just go ahead and meet us out front. Okay. Ma'am. Yes. Does she feel stiff? Excuse me. Does she feel stiff? Yes. Yeah. I love her. I, yeah. do. I don't even want to turn her over. I'm terrified. Oh, okay. All right. Why don't you just go ahead and meet us out front? Okay. We'll be there shortly. Okay. Oh, okay. When police arrived to her Pasadena home, she was pronounced dead at the scene. And four days later, on December 30th, a Los Angeles County coroner found no signs of trauma or a cause of death and concluded she had died from natural causes. However, some speculate that her death maybe had something to do with an incident that happened in 2004. While Tina Marie was sleeping in a hotel room, a large picture frame fell and struck her in the head. The blow caused a serious concussion that caused momentary seizures for the rest of her life. She also suffered a generalized tonic clonic seizure a month before her death. Uh, and I had some uh, accidents. I had a huge picture fall off a ho hotel room wall and hit me in the head while I was sleeping. Uh, which caused me to start having seizures. But yeah, it's tragic what happened here. I mean, her daughter, Aaliyah, sounded so sad and devastated. Anyway, nothing but best wishes to the entire family. Now let's move on to the next call. No an emergency, do you need police or paramedics? Uh, no, I believe we have a, uh, looks like a murder-suicide. What do you see? Oh, uh, there's two bodies down. I'm, I'm a... Robbie Gordon, born January 2nd, 1969 in Los Angeles, California. He is best known for racing a NASCAR and in many other forms of competitive driving. On September 14th, 2016, a 911 call was made by a close family friend of Robbie Gordon's father, and he tells the dispatcher this. There's two bodies down. I'm, I'm a... Why do you say murder-suicide? Well, they're both deceased. I was a 30-year LA County fireman. I know a body when I see one. Are they they're in? Both, they're both in, inside, and they look like they've been down for quite a while. Why do you say murder suicide? Were there any weapons? Well, yeah, yes, there is. What type? Uh, looks like one, one of the bodies is in the bathroom, and I, it's hard to get that door open, but I, okay. can, I can see a long rifle laying on the floor. Where's the male at? She is in the bedroom. He's in the bathroom. Is there anybody else in there? Yeah, her daughter's here, and there'll be other people showing up. Showing we need to make sure everybody waits outside. Can you do that for me? I will. Don't let them in the yeah. house, okay? We we need to keep them outside. All right, what's okay. their names? Uh, uh, Bob and Sharon Gordon. Okay, do you hear the siren? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you've already walked into the house, correct? And yes. did you go through the whole house? Well, they're upstairs, so yeah, I went through the house, went upstairs, okay. and I just checked for a pulse, but it, uh, with her, she, she's open in the bedroom, okay. but there's, you know, obviously there's rigor set in, so, okay. uh, but I, I tried to get in the bathroom, but I didn't want to push the door open too far. Okay, okay so you couldn't check on the house. Okay. Let me just turn off the siren, so that would be close. Okay, you have contact? Yeah, yeah, they're just right here. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'll disconnect. As you just heard, the retired firefighter said that it looked like a murder-suicide, and he was right. They quickly learned that their deaths were a result of a murder-suicide by his father, Bob Gordon, who strangled his wife, Sharon, before shooting himself in a home in Southern California. Sandra devastated. Robbie Gordon just came out of the house here that he grew up in to give that statement about the shocking death of his dad and stepmom who lived right next door or lived next door, a home that he gave them. And Robbie, he would not say what happened, only that the truth will come out and thanked everyone for their support. I'd like everybody to understand this is very, very tough. And it's, um, it's not only tough for me, but it's tough for my sister, Robin, Becky, and uh, my sister, which is um, Sharon's daughter, uh, Haley. That's gonna be tough on all of us. A couple well known in the auto racing community found dead inside their home in this upscale neighborhood in Orange. Anyway, guys, I couldn't find any other details on this case. I wanted to find the why of, you know, of why this happened. 
but I couldn't find anything else. Anyway, let's move on to the next call. Sheriff's office? Um, yes, hi. I need to please speak with the sheriff um, that can help me with a family member that's um, uh, very, very ill. They just got out of a mental facility. They were Scott Stapp, born on August 8th, 1973 in Orlando, Florida. He is best known for playing the lead singer in the band Creed. He has also released three solo albums, The Great Divide, Proof of Life, and The Space Between the Shadows. Now there's three 911 calls here and they were made in between November and December of 2014. These 911 calls and this case in general, I think it gives you an insight into a man who is suffering from drug addiction and mental disorders. And it also shows what happens if left untreated. Anyway, let's take a listen to the calls. Well, they just got out of a mental facility. They were last week in Tallahassee, and now um, I don't know what to do. They're in some danger now. He's off of the drugs, but he's going crazy, and he's on a bike. He's not wearing a shirt. He's got long hair. He has a bottle of pills, but he's very, very ill. I called the doctor, the psychiatrist at the treatment center. They said, call the police. He needs to be, but you can only do it to the police. I don't know what to do. What is he doing that you think that the police would be able to do? He thinks he's he thinks he's part of the CIA. He thinks he's try, they're trying to kill him, and he has a bunch of paperwork in his backpack that he's a CIA agent and he was supposed to assassinate Obama. And he's on a bike. He's on a bicycle with no shirts and two backpacks with CIA and Central Intelligence documents. That he thinks are central intelligence documents. Or... He, he he thinks he's being trained by the CIA. And um, what else does he have in the backpack besides paperwork? Um, we believe just um, uh, tools, a bunch of tools. His car was taken. A wrench, a, a, a wrench, uh, a screwdrivers, um, hard drives. A lot of hard drives. Okay. When he's being schizophrenic, he has a history of this. He collects a lot of weird belongings, a lot of pieces of paper which says C4 on it, and explosive. He's, he's, Has he always suffered from this, or is this all? Yeah, no, he. Related, or what? No, he's always suffered for this, the paranoia schizophrenia, um, but then he self-medicates, and he's been in eight rehabs. He's been in rehab about eight, eight to ten times. Um, a lot of arrests. You know, but I stood by him because we know he's ill. You know, we, I, I love him, and I, we want to see him get better, but I just need law enforcement help because that's the only way he's going to stop is when he hits his rock bottom. 911 emergency. Yes, I'd like to report a stolen vehicle. My wife said that she took it, she's selling it, and she's keeping the money, and I can off. Okay, so it's not a stolen vehicle. Yes, it is a stolen vehicle because okay. it's not in her name. It's in my name. Okay. okay where are you now, sir? What, what gives her the right to, to confiscate my vehicle, sell it, and say she's keeping the money? Okay, unfortunately, if you guys are married... She just filed for divorce on October 18th. Okay, I understand, sir, and I understand you're frustrated, but there's also laws that have to go with when people are married. This is more of a okay, domestic so, issue. Okay, so can I go home now and steal her car? Um, it wouldn't be stealing, so that it's her car as much as it is yours if you guys are married. You guys purchased the vehicle it's, it's, it's after you car. were married. I can't believe in America that someone can just take your vehicle, sell it without your permission, and keep the money. What kind of country we live in? And I'm on a bicycle since she stole my car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she threatened to blackmail me uh, and said that uh, if I went to the police about the stolen money, mm -hmm. uh, then she would uh, release to the public uh, supposed pictures she says she has or anything else she can do to try to defame me and ruin my reputation and my career. She's already began that. Allison County, now on. As someone is trying to kill me. I have called three times. I'm running down the highway. Okay? I've called 911 about eight times on this trip I've had working, and no one ever shows up. 
You're on, you're on foot? What are you wearing, sir? I'm on foot. I've got a backpack on. I've got jeans and a white tank top. Jeans and a what tank top? I had, to, I had to immediately get out of my car. Jeans and a what tank top? A white tank top. All right? I, it was an undershirt. Who, who is trying to hurt you? I, had, I don't know. Okay? You don't know? I've been, run, I've been running for about six or seven weeks trying to keep them away from my family. Okay? So, but, you, but you don't know who this somebody is? Told me, somebody told me that there's already a report that I've been killed. Okay? That's already on the Internet. I don't know if it's true or not, but I'm not dead. I'm alive. And I need some help. You don't know where this person is? No. It's been multiple. It's been large groups of cars. Okay? It could have been uh, messed with or tampered with. Uh, I was about to run out of gas, so I abandoned the vehicle. But you're headed to the you're headed to the ambulance truck, yes? Yes, right now. Yeah, they made me run to them. Stay on the phone with me, okay? Stay on the phone with me until you get to them, okay? I'm like, I want to stay on the phone with you the whole time. Can I go to the hospital? Good. I need to go to the hospital, sir. Yeah. I'm going to have a chest pain. Can I go to the hospital, please? Because someone's trying to kill me. Yes. I've already been reported dead, okay? Can you take me to the hospital? Thank you. Uh, you all right? Can you please? We, we, oh, no, stay with me. Can okay. You do a blood test so, so no one can accuse me of doing drugs? All right. It was reported that I was killed uh, last week, okay? But I've been on the run, okay, to keep them away from my family. Okay, about $20 million of my money has been stolen. Okay, these people are trying to cover it up. This is a fact. Banks already know about it. There's already an investigation going on. Okay, so I have all the information to get to the police officers, and I just need to get to the hospital. I have a meeting in two days. So Scott was later placed on a psychiatric hold after threatening to kill himself. He stayed for three days, but his estranged wife pleaded a 60-day hold for the musician. However, he went on to miss a court hearing and lost custody of his kids. And days later, Scott posted this video online saying things like, someone stole my money from my bank accounts and saying that he's been sleeping in his truck. A few other things have happened um, over the last four or five weeks. Um, all of a sudden, the IRS has frozen my bank accounts two or three times uh, to leave me completely penniless. Um, I, I don't even understand that, uh, why all this is happening at the same time. Uh, when I called uh, to find out why, they said, oh, we had an address uh, mix up. It was a clerical error. Uh, so we'll return your funds in nine to ten months. Um, I don't understand how that's fair in, in America and in the country that we live in. You know, right now I'm living in a Holiday Inn by the grace of God because there's been uh, a couple weeks where I had to sleep in my truck. Uh, I had no money, not even for gas or food. Uh, I went two days without eating because uh, I had no money and uh, ended up in an emergency room. Uh, when I called the bank uh, to see what happened to the funds that I had remaining in the, in the bank, uh, someone had called, used my information, I guess they had my information, uh, and changed my online passwords uh, to my bank accounts and transferred all the money uh, out of my bank accounts uh, so I had nothing. I uh, reported this to the bank four different times in person at four different branches also via the phone four different times and every time until yesterday when I called and asked about, you know, how the investigation was going and what was going on, they told me no one's ever filed any fraud charges or made any claims, uh, which blew my mind. Uh, I have all this documented. Uh, I have conversations uh, with the uh, bank representatives on the phone recorded uh, so I can use it in court. 
Uh, I don't understand again why all this is happening to me. So eventually, Scott got the help that he needed. He went into rehab and got treated for bipolar disorder, which went undiagnosed for years. In 2006, he jumped off a balcony in Miami and fell 40 feet. He survived after being discovered by rapper T.I. with a fractured skull, broken nose, and hip. He admitted that he'd been taking drugs like Percocet, Xanax, and Pednazone. Scott yeah. Stepp, who's a, uh, a phenomenal guy, man, that found himself in a, in a tough emotional spot, and, and he tried to kill himself. He wanted to jump to his death, uh, but he landed on the top of my patio. I looked up, and I saw a guy moaning and groaning because I, I couldn't really see anything. It was dark. It was nighttime. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, I think he tried to get up when he was already kind of busted up down at the bottom of his legs. So when he tried to get up, he fell again. Boom. So this time he fell a little closer so I could actually see him then. And I was like, yeah, we were both like, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, chill. What's going on? And he said that his girlfriend had, had cheated on him, I think with his, one of his best friends or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, and he said, well, I just want to die. Da, da, da. And we talked him into allowing us to call some help for him. And they came up and got him and we took him off. Wow. Yeah. But in the incidents that happened in 2014, he said this. I was out of my mind, delusional, turned on everyone that I loved, made wild and crazy accusations about my wife. I mean, it was a manic, paranoid, psychotic episode. I was driving around with a 12-gate shotgun in my lap, and I thought that people were trying to kill me. He also mentioned that he took 120 milligrams of Adderall, which led him into this full-blown psychotic episode. As of now, Scott seems to be doing well and living a sober life. In a statement from 2019, he actually said this. My wife and my kids were critical in helping me get sober. I got to the point where it was either get sober or lose my wife and kids, man. And that's about the lowest rock bottom that I could possibly have gotten to. So they were critical. I'm so glad that he got better. I mean, this could have ended so badly. Thankfully, it didn't. I wish him nothing but the best. He also has a beautiful family. He's just got to, you know, keep on that path of sobriety and if you're suffering from any of this keep in mind that there's light at the end of that tunnel believe me there is just keep at it and stay strong anyway let's move on to the next one well i think this is the last one actually so Nine one one. what is the address of the emergency okay just repeat the apartment number Okay, what's the phone number you're calling from? It's a problem, tell me what happened. Um, I think my been, I mean, my been overdosed and he won't wake up. Is he breathing? I don't know, he can't get in there. Okay, where is he? Tyler G, born on June 18th, 1990 in Boca Raton, Florida. He was best known for being the laid back guy and going with the flow kind of attitude in the ABC reality dating TV show The Bachelorette season 15. But he left the show in week three without any explanation. Tyler was also a psychology graduate and aspired to obtain a PhD. But on January 13th of 2020, a woman calls 911 and begs the dispatcher to send help as soon as possible. Let's find out why. I don't know, I can't get in there. Okay, where is he? He's in my bathroom. And there's no way to get in? Is anyone able to open the door? No, he's like not responsive. Send, will you please send an ambulance? Yes, we are sending them. Just stay on the line, okay? Just hold on. <laughs> How old is he? He's 30, he's 29. Okay. Is there anyone with you? No, he just came out of my body. He was going to the bathroom. Okay, was the door locked or you just can't get it open? Yes, it's locked. Okay, hold on one second. What did he take? <laughs> Do you know what he took? Yeah, I've got the police and the paramedics on the way as fast as they can to help you, okay? Just stay on the line. Do you know what he took? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, do you, is there a Narcan available there? 
According to police, a syringe and a powdery substance were found on the vanity in the home's bathroom. Tyler was then given Narcan by medics. Unfortunately, he died in the hospital a week later. The medical examiner determined Tyler died as a result of opioid toxicity. His death was ruled as an accident. Oh, and by the way, his family started the Tyler G Foundation in his memory. They said his struggles with opioid addiction prompted the mission for the nonprofit, which is dedicated to helping individuals battling addiction. Former Bachelorette contestant Tyler G has died at the age of 29. The Boca Raton PD confirms to ET that they responded to a medical overdose involving Tyler. He just was really calming and nurturing for me to feel confident going into these one-on-ones. But he mysteriously left the show one week after. The Bachelorette alum also said that the reason for his departure wasn't aired in order to respect his privacy. And again, I wanna thank all of you for watching, even if you're not a member or a patron. I still just, I love all of you. You guys are a bunch of great people, man. Seriously, I love you guys so much. But anyway, I want to thank the channel members real quick. Nanya Bez, Josie, Queen G, PLD1220, Michelle Perrino, Jennifer Nettles, Cassandra King, Mercedes Escoto Wagner, and Rainbow Potion. And now to the patrons. Chrissy Marie Catherine, Ariel J, Jen J71, Brittany Marchbanks, Darla Curry, Catherine E.B. Dell, 
Cream of the Crop, Marilyn Grazier, Baba Yaga, Taryn Horton, Jennifer Nutt, AM, Sylvia Busanko, Trua M. Stewart, Marina, Christine Simmons, Peggy Darley, Karen Perez, Jesus is Lord, Terry Benson, Caroline Banana, Karen Harris, and Karen. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you guys so much, man. It really, like I said, it really just it means a lot to me. I think I have like over 20 patrons now. And then three, four, five, six, like eight channel members. I can't really see. I'm blind, but I don't know, man. I'm overwhelmed. Again, thank you guys so much. My last three, four, I don't even know. But I just, I just give up at this point. All of my videos, I was, they're just going to get demonetized. I don't know why. Put all this work and yada, yada, yada. But I've, anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I love you all so much. I'm going to go and edit. I'm actually working on a video right now. And uh, yeah, love you. Take care. Be safe. Take care of yourselves. And uh, bye.